how short-term gains helped a leading cloud provider to prioritize accessibility. Uh, but before we hop into the meat of the presentation, we'd like to introduce ourselves as well, provide a little bit of visual description. So my name is Rachel Penfill. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, and for the introduction, I am a UX manager and accessibility lead here at Sandstorm Design. And I'm also CPAC certified by the IAAP. So that is a certified professional in the in accessibility core competencies from the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. Uh, and I am a white woman with shoulder length, wavy brown hair. Uh, in the photo on the screen, I'm wearing a kind of green chiffon-y V-neck top against a dark gray background. But today I'm wearing a black sweater and some colorful patterned earrings. And I will hand it over to Devin to introduce themselves. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, my name is Devin Owsley Aquila. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And I am, uh, like Tamar said in the beginning, the Scrum Master in Accessibility Lead here at Sandstorm. Uh, and just like Rachel, I also have my CPAC certification by the IAAP, uh, where we are also both members of the International Association for Accessibility Professionals. Uh, and by way of introduction with my visual description, uh, on the image here today, and much like I'm matching the <laughs> outfit in the picture, uh, I am a light-skinned non-binary person, uh, blonde hair pulled up into an updo with an undercut, wearing a black turtleneck sweater. Uh, I happen to be smiling off to the side of the camera in my image. Uh, I happen to be looking also at Rachel and smiling because I'm just so excited to be presenting with them today. Uh, and I'm in a room with a gray wall in the background. And we are fine. And again, we're just so excited to be here today and presenting at uh, AxCon. Uh, a little bit about us, we're a global digital agency that's been around for over 20 years now. Uh, and companies look to partner with us to help design and build more intuitive, intentional, and inclusive website experiences across the board. Um, and also, in addition to our accessibility and inclusion design expertise, uh, we've completed over 4,200 hours of in-depth UX research, uh, which means we really understand your user needs, their motivations, and their behaviors to help inform our own process. Okay, uh, and like in the beginning of our session, uh, we had this unique opportunity to uh, work with a leading cloud service provider. Uh, they had asked us to help them improve the overall usability and accessibility of their training and certification information on their website. Uh, and this opportunity came up for a few reasons. Uh, number one, they had an upcoming brand refresh. Uh, additionally, they were getting a lot of reports from users being really frustrated with their site, uh, a big one being users were consistently reporting uh, that they couldn't find the information easily on the site, uh, which is a big issue. And they knew they had accessibility issues, but really wanted our help to help identify those issues and what they were uh, so that we can plan also to help them uh, implement the remediation plan uh, in place. Excuse me, stumbling over my words this morning. <laughs> So basically, in short, we needed to help answer, can users figure out what they need on this site? And can users find and access what they need? And I'm going to hand it back over to Rachel, who's going to take us through some of our initial challenges while we're setting up this project. All right. Thanks, Devin. So excuse the siren in the background. I'm going to just That's what happens when you live on a busy street. Okay, one more. All right, so as we approach this project, uh, we knew we would have some challenges to overcome. So first, the team that we were working with uh, for a client didn't own all of their own content. They were a smaller business unit of a larger company. And so they didn't have control over what exactly got posted or by whom or how. And sometimes they needed to go to other business units to get content or have their site updated. And we also had different teams managing brand, content, and functionality. So there were a lot of different moving parts, uh, and those parts were all controlled by different people. We were also working in an ecosystem that had different sites with different user experiences. So it was this whole microsite ecosystem, but we only got to touch one of the sites, not all of them. 
Uh, we also knew that we weren't going to have access to their back end. Uh, in usual scenarios, we like to go into a client's CMS and have a better understanding on how they're managing their content so that we can customize a training or the research according to their needs in that way. Uh, but here, we didn't really know the details of what the content administration process was like for the client, and we also wouldn't be able to implement any fixes on our own. So uh, based on the needs of this training and certification client, uh, Sandstorm crafted an approach that leveraged both user research and uh, some automated audits, which we'll talk about in just a second, uh, to create actionable recommendations around both usability and accessibility. Uh, originally, the plan was more focused on usability and SEO improvements, but after further discussions with the client, we quickly realized that while testing the current site for overall usability was really important, there were also big gaps in terms of accessibility, which also thankfully was a priority for the client. So we proposed a three-pronged approach, which you can kind of see in this stylized Venn diagram on the left-hand side of the screen. And the approach consisted of an automated accessibility audit, a manual review of the site for accessibility and usability tests. And when we're conducting usability tests, we always strive for a diverse pool of users, uh, but given the reach of this cloud provider and the priorities of the project, it was especially important to speak to users with disabilities. And luckily for us, the client was very open and excited to collaborate and learn the strategies and tactics that we could provide to make the site more accessible. So overall, we had two deliverables. First, an actionable UX report, which covered the results of the usability tests, and of course, some overlapping items from the accessibility audits. And second, a customized accessibility training session. Uh, I think we actually did two sessions uh, for people that would be touching the back end of the site. So content editors, developers, designers, uh, so they would have takeaways to implement themselves. And some of the topics we knew we would touch during this training was things like content language, proper use of color, how to write good alt text, and of course, a lot more. So we were able to simultaneously kickstart the usability studies and the automated accessibility audit on 120 sample pages from the client. Uh, we used DQ's Axe Dev Tools on 120 pages. And the reason we wanted to do these at the same time is because you really don't need to complete one before you complete the other. And doing them simultaneously helps us gain efficiently, efficiency and uh, save money for the client, which of course is always a win. And now I'm going to kick it back to Devin to talk a little bit about how we got our participants. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, so to recruit all of our participants, we put together what's called a usability study uh, participant screener. And ideally, we want to make sure that we're talking to people who actually use the website. But like Rachel said, it's really important for us here at Sandstorm that we're talking to a diverse group of users uh, to ensure that our data is, is, is as robust and inclusive as possible. And in ideal scenarios, we do always recommend including users with disabilities in testing. Uh, and there's a lot of great recruitment agencies out there that you can partner with that do this extensive testing with users with disabilities. Uh, but unfortunately, our client didn't actually have the additional resources particularly earmarked for this. But that doesn't mean you can't find other ways to actually include users with disabilities in your research. And we did this by making a smarter and more inclusive recruitment screener with a flushed out demographic section. So we were asking uh, users what their age was, their gender identity, racial or ethnicity, or ethnic identity, there we go, <laughs> uh, disability, assistive technology, as well as their name and their pronouns. And in doing this and asking those demographic questions, you're gonna have a better understanding of who your users are uh, and what experiences that they actually bring to the research, which is really important. Uh, we do commonly get asked why we're asking about disability and assistive technology use separately. Basically, in short, we want to make sure as accessible and inclusive as possible uh, because everyone who is disabled uses assistive technology and not everyone who uses assistive technology identifies as disabled. Uh, and some who just may not feel comfortable disclosing their, their disability may actually feel comfortable disclosing the fact that they use tools like screen readers, uh, speech to text software, or just other uh, adaptive uses or assistive technologies that help them navigate the website. So this means we're still getting to learn about these participants and their particular experiences in our research, which is the goal and it's awesome. <laughs> and uh, 
Before users actually uh, begin the demographic section in the survey, uh, we do make sure to provide some brief context as to you know, why we're asking these questions in the first place and why do we have a demographic section. Uh, in full transparency, uh, this actually helps to model inclusive best practices within your own process. It also lets users know that, hey, we really want to talk to you and we value your experiences because they matter to us. Uh, so an example um, of what this paragraph could look like is actually displayed on the screen here today, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it aloud. So section three, demographic information. Great usability is only possible after inclusive and diverse testing practices. In order to establish a smooth, functional, and delightful user experience for all, uh, we conduct conductive comprehensive well, we conduct comprehensive, there we go, <laughs> user testing with diverse participants. Uh, so we're considering gender identity, race, ethnicity, use of assistive technologies, and disabilities such as, but certainly not limited to blindness, deaf or hard of hearing, mobility impairments, and cognitive disabilities. In this section, we are going to ask you for demographic information to ensure that we're meeting this inclusive criteria. So in short, we're basically explaining why we're asking for this information and what we're gonna do with it. We've also set up uh, the questions to uh, be so that users can select multiple options for each of the questions itself. And we're always providing an option I choose not to disclose as well as an open field to actually type in their answer if uh, we don't have an answer for them to select. We tried really hard to be as exhaustive as possible, but we also recognize that identity is complex. Uh, and this just is, uh, in general, just in line with uh, the best inclusive practices out there. So also, we also wanted to make sure that the demographic section is uh, known to be optional. No one has to share this information if they don't want to. Okay. So probably wondering how did we uh, win over the clients with this flushed out demographic section. Uh, here at Sandstorm, we're always trying to be at, and make sure that we're being good partners uh, with our clients, which means including them in their process at every step of the way uh, where we can and when we can. Uh, and better results just come uh, when you're presenting the screener to the clients up front and actually walking them through your decisions uh, rather than sending it over for your clients to kind of discover in their own time, which could lead to a lot of back and forth uh, with your client asking a lot of questions. That's just going to eat up a lot of time uh, and can potentially put your client's budget and their timeline at risk. Uh, so when you are explaining this in the forefront, you want to make sure that you're explaining the why to your what. So for instance, uh, why are users allowed to select more than one answer uh, in each question? Uh, that's because we want to honor that identity is complex. Again, we want to be as exhaustive as possible, but also respectful and inclusive as we're able to be. And also, it's really important to explain why this section is optional. It's really important. People don't have to disclose this information if they don't want to. And also, you know, when you're explaining your reasoning in the, in the upfront, you can avoid a lot of the common questions that we've actually heard from clients. So some of these questions could be like, uh, hey, the screener is really long. Do we actually need to be asking all of these questions? Uh, can we use a different word uh, other than disabled? Uh, can we oops, excuse me, backing up. Uh, are you able to, dis are you disqualifying people based on their responses, which clearly we're not? Uh, and also how is this relevant to our product? So, you know, avoiding all of these questions and being prepared for these potential client questions uh, and simply making your case in the beginning is just the best case scenario. It also really helps to have a backup of your resources. So maybe some trusted articles and just general research uh, to share with your client as well, just so they know that you've actually gone the extra length and done this research uh, and uh, are not just making the decision on the fly, right? And if your client already has DEI initiatives of their own, uh, having an inclusive UX process to test their own website helps to meet those initiatives that they already set up in the first place, which is just, you know, a really helpful tool to have in your back pocket. Basically, in the end, it, this is just good usability practice. Uh, having a more diverse user sample means more robust and more inclusive results. Uh, because of our screener, we were able to learn a lot about our users, and we really wanted to highlight today some of the wins that we don't usually see in tech. So uh, starting from the left, moving to the right, uh, you can see that 40% of our users that disclosed their race uh, did not identify as white or European. Uh, and also that the majority of our users were between the ages of 30 years old to 49 years old. However, some were a little bit younger using the site versus a little bit older than that, that age bracket as well. 
And also 36% of our users identified as non-binary or preferred not to say versus the 64% of users that identified as Uh, similarly, we learned that 25% of people identified as disabled or choose not to self-identify, which is actually in line with a lot of known uh, popular stats in the United States. Uh, however, we may have not known this had we not asked in the first place. So um, additionally, we learned that 20% of our participants use assistive technology and disclosed that they used uh, tools like screen readers, uh, text-to-speech software, uh, joysticks or trackballs, and that they also use animation blockers. Having this data is really important uh, and extremely helpful to demonstrate the value of inclusive design and accessibility to our clients and hopefully helps to debunk some of those harmful assumptions about who's actually using the web and who's actually using their website. Again, we didn't have to work too hard to win over our clients since they already prioritize accessibility uh, and they were really excited to hear from a wide variety of users with different perspectives. And this also helped to humanize all of the people that they were training and certifying. Uh, and now I'm going to pass it back to Rachel, who's going to take us through our usability process. Awesome. Thank you, Devin. So, of course, once we had our participants, it was time to conduct the studies. So first, we'll talk about the virtual usability study process, and then we'll talk about overlapping findings between the usability studies and the accessibility review. So first, just to make sure that we are all on the same page, uh, we want to talk a little bit about those virtual usability studies. So of course, here at Sandstorm, we're following best practices. And generally, our usability studies consist of six to eight participants in one-to-one -one studies uh, that take about 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, we always hear that six to eight participants does not sound like a lot of users, but we do know from well-established UX research uh, that you only need five users to discover about 85% of your usability problems. So having six to eight is absolutely sufficient for one study. And our evaluation protocols usually consist of an orientation, so instructions and assuring users that we're not testing them, instead we're testing the experience or the website. A behavior discussion, so what things they commonly do on the web or on that site in particular. Uh, a navigation testing, design impressions, user tasks, and then additional insights. So we have here an example of what those usability studies are looking like right now. Of course, we've been conducting them virtually over Zoom for the past two years. And so here you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, a clickable wireframe prototype that we house in Envision. And then on the right, you can see our participant who is sharing her screen with us. And she is a light-skinned female presenting user. And she is thinking pretty hard while she's trying to complete this task. And when I say task, we give users specific tasks. So for example, find X piece of information and we watch what they go through. And we also listen to what they say and what, watch what they do. Where do they struggle? What's confusing for them? What doesn't make sense? What's super easy? And whether or not they successfully complete a task is of course important, but watching their paths and listening to their feedback is what helps us improve the experience overall. So when we finish these reports, uh, we create a report. So, and we always make sure that that report is actionable. So what you can see here is a dark skinned man reading an actual excerpt of the report that we created for the cloud service provider on his laptop. So what a report will generally include is a high level summary of key insights, uh, an explanation of the tasks that users were presented with, the number and the percentage of users who passed, passed with difficulty or just failed the task entirely. And we also provide insights that we gathered from completing the tasks. So for example, where users tended to click instead of what we had thought would be the success case and other kinds of behavior patterns that we identify. And we also provide recommendations for addressing those insights and improving the overall UX. And now I'm going to pass it back over to Devin to talk a little bit about how we started to set up our content admin training. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, so we're going to switch gears again and talk about our uh, to creating the web accessibility training that was targeted to our clients, uh, content editors, content administrators, and basically anyone who can uh, implement those fixes on their site. 
And uh, as we were setting up our training, uh, we were trying to gather as many supportive examples as possible. Uh, and with our three-pronged strategy, we really set ourselves up to have a lot of identified areas for improvement. And knowing that good UX is accessible UX, we really wanted our client to make those connections and walk away with that key concept. So basically anywhere on the site that it was dinged for accessibility and also supported within our usability findings, uh, we made sure to include these examples included in our training. Uh, and today we're going to share six instances of where this occurred and I'll send it back over to Rachel to take us through the first three. Awesome. So our first finding was that users were really frustrated with that they had to remember previous choices. So, of course, we know both UX best practices and accessibility best practices are to not make your users remember previous choices they made, especially when there's a lot of information and options to remember from screen to screen. But on our client site, we found that that's not what was really going on. So, for example, we've given a flow here of how someone might get to exam prep materials for the solutions architect associate level. So first they had to go to the get certified page, then to the certification overview page where they had to figure out what certification they wanted and what level it was at. So pick the specific certification and also was it associate, was it foundational, was it professional or some other level. They then from there had to go to the prepare for an exam page and remember what level the certification they wanted was. They had to go and then select that from a particular accordion. So here they may, they would have had to expand the associate level certification accordion and then remember exactly which certification it was they wanted. There was more than one which, within each of these levels. So if they were able to remember that, they would then go to the associate level certifications page where they had to remember the name of the certification again, uh, again, that solutions architect, and then they would finally be able to get their exam prep materials. So as you can see, earlier choices and personalization were completely lost as users went deeper into the site and users had to remember quite a lot of information from one screen to another. And of course, this is frustrating for all users, but especially users with memory related disabilities or other kinds of cognitive disabilities. So the recommendation here seems deceptively simple. Uh, we want to close loops that move users from a specific selection to a more generic page that requires them to make that same selection again. So uh, users should not have to remember previous choices. It's a lot of mental energy, again, especially for those with cognitive disabilities. And you want to do as much remembering for your, for your users as you possibly can, especially when there are a lot of options to choose from. All right, our second overlapping finding was that users were really frustrated when they unintentionally activated a hover menu. So what you can see here on the screen, we have two of the, both of the navigations pulled up. On the left-hand side, you can see outlined by a red box, the menu specifically for our client's microsite, so that training and certifications microsite. And then above that, you can see uh, the menu for the parent site, the parent brand. And on the right-hand side, you can see what happens when you hover over that, ex that parent brand's menu. It takes up the entire screen and actually completely hides that secondary menu where all of our clients' specific menu options lived. So when a user was trying to make a selection within that hover menu, first, of course, it hid options from the users, again, that secondary training and certification menu, uh, but also their movements had to be really, really precise to get to the item of choice within each of the three columns that you can see. Uh, if you make the wrong move, the item that you're trying to get to, for example, if it's in that right hand most column, just completely disappears. Uh, this is a concern for all users, of course, but especially those with physical or motor disabilities who might get trapped in a hover menu or may be entirely unable to reach the item they're trying to get to. So the recommendation here would be to implement a more streamlined click to expand menu that doesn't require precise movements on hover to get to the item you're looking for. Uh, and that also doesn't hide those secondary menu options in case someone is not finding the option they're looking for in that primary menu. Uh, our third overlapping finding is that users wanted larger font sizes, probably not a surprise to anyone here. So, as you can see on the screen, 
Uh, just one page on the site had five different font sizes and options. So we had 24 pixel regular font, uh, 14 pixel light font, which you can see is outlined in red is something that was too small. Uh, 24 pixel bold font, 20 pixel bold font, and 14 pixel regular font. Uh, users commented that they had difficulty reading small font, especially when it was lighter weight. So they had issues reading both of the 14 pixel fonts, but the higher up on the page example, where it's also a light weight, was incredibly difficult for users to read. Uh, so this is against accessibility best practices, but it's also against best practices for writing for the web and just text presentation on the web in general. And users were super frustrated when they had to use their native browser tools to zoom in. So the recommendation here, of course, would be to increase that minimum font size to at least 16 pixels and to make the font a heavier weight. Uh, larger, heavier weighted fonts are much easier for users with and without disabilities to read. And you never want to rely on a user's level of tech savviness to make your content readable for your users. Overall, they'll just get frustrated or if they're not as tech savvy and don't understand browser controls, uh, they may not be able to access the information at all. And now I'm going to pass it back over to Devin to talk about three more overlapping findings that we have. Okay, uh, so the fourth instance uh, where we had overlapping findings, again, was uh, information on the homepage was really overwhelming for their users. And on the example we have on the screen is uh, on the left hand side is just a close up of their training and certification homepage. Uh, we were trying to show you uh, how text heavy all of the content is. Uh, and then the other screenshot is just showing you how long the home page was and how much information was actually on the page, uh, which from an accessibility perspective, uh, it's not really easy to, you know, make sense of all of the information and the visual structure of the page is just not clear, uh, which is not good for general scannability uh, and content digestibility. So, of course, users were really confused and overwhelmed with the sheer amount of information on this page. Uh, it was also really confusing because there were uh, a few instances of quote unquote false bottoms on the page. Uh, this is where a user may think that they've reached the end of the page and may not continue to scroll. Uh, but users who, you know, can, did continue to scroll in our findings were really surprised that, you know, they could continue to scroll on the page. They were really surprised at the length uh, and were really confused that, you know, is this the end of the page? Uh, is this the page? So, uh, you know, again, that was also supported within our usability testing. Also, the home page had about 14 distinct sections on it, and users said that they really didn't know where to start looking uh, because there were so many sections to look at. Um, also, not all of the 14 sections and the information was actually relevant in their eyes. Uh, the organization of the information also really didn't make sense to them either. Uh, a huge accessibility issue I mentioned earlier. Uh, and just overall, users explained that it was too overwhelming uh, and they would just click on the first button that just said, go to this certification or go to this training without reading any of the content on the page, which is, you know, the whole point of a homepage. Uh, you're having a lot of missed opportunity there to showcase, you know, what's going on on your site. So our recommendation here is simply cut the home page length by 30 to 50 percent and also only include the items that were most important to our users. Uh, and also since users complained that the home page was really text heavy and just weren't either reading it or were just really overwhelmed, uh, going in and supplementing succinct images uh, to help support the text that's there uh, and help break up and will actually help reach those users who prefer that visual content um, as well. So that's that. And our next and fifth instance is that users liked infographics, but you know, if they are interactive, they needed to communicate clickability. Uh, on the screen here, we're showing an example of one of those uh, interactive infographics for their available certifications. Uh, on the left hand side, it starts from top to bottom, professional certification, uh, associate certifications all the way down to foundational. And then on the right hand side is just a cluster of their specialty certifications that didn't really fall into the categories, categories of uh, professional, associate, or foundational. In general, this can be a really nice way to communicate information for people who prefer to visually absorb that information, but they tend to cause a lot of accessibility issues, especially if they don't have appropriate text alternatives or if they don't meet the color contrast requirements amongst a various uh, amount of other considerations as well. And this 
particular infographic actually had buttons in the shape of hexagons. However, there was actually no way to tell that they were buttons because there was no active uh, or no visible hover state or uh, uh, focus state to indicate that this is clickable. Uh, the only way you were even indicated that you were uh, about to click on something was that the mouse was changing from a simple pointer uh, or arrow uh, to a small hand, which is a really subtle way to uh, you know, showcase that. And it's really hard uh, to see on a desktop computer screen. And it just wouldn't happen at all on mobile because you can't actually do any kind of hover on a mobile screen. So this meant that users were missing these clickable buttons uh, to the content that they were already actively looking for. So that content being what certification do I wanna get? How do I prep for it? How do I find more information on it? Uh, if they're still looking for this information where then they could have found it directly on here, that's just really frustrating. So, we recommended that to our client uh, to ensure that there is clear visible focus uh, and hover states for each of the buttons and also making sure that the different states uh, rely on color alone to help communicate that information and that they're using a combination of color changes and non-color cues to indicate those state changes. Uh, hover states and focus states are really important uh, for showing users where they are on the page uh, and what selection they're about to make. Uh, which is especially important for users with uh, motor disabilities and just any user who is navigating visually uh, by mouse or by keyboard navigation. Okay, the final and sixth uh, instance of where we're having this overlap is that people like to con uh, consume information in different ways. In this learn by solution example, the client used both uh, icons and text to differentiate between the various specialized cloud services that they offer. Uh, and because people have different learning styles in general, that means they like to experience information presented um, in uh, different ways. So for example, uh, pairing meaningful icons with text can help increase scannability and the comprehension for all users. It can also help users who may not understand written language as well to help find what they need. So for example, this is extremely helpful for non-native speakers uh, and also really helpful for users with dyslexia. Also using a combination of icons and images uh, helps to create good visual landmarks on a page and gives sighted users a visual quote unquote break uh, from reading lots of text, which is just in line with good best practices for writing web content in general. So our recommendation here is pretty simple. Uh, continue using a combination of text with graphics, videos, and maybe some other type of content uh, that support each other and helps support as many uh, different users as possible. All right, uh, so as you can see, we did catch a lot of those accessibility opportunities within our usability studies, again, supported by by our accessibility audit process. Uh, so we're using a combination of the automated scan and manual review together to help capture uh, those additional accessibility improvements that we wanted to include in the training. So we're looking for, you know, does the site have alt text that's there? Is it good? Uh, does your site have proper headings and subheadings? And is it properly coded? Uh, is your link text meaningful? Do your colors meet contrast ratio requirements? Can I navigate your site just using a keyboard alone? And can I tell where I am just navigating by a keyboard? And also we're checking for missed opportunities to help show users where they are in a site. So are, is there missing uh, current states and menus? Uh, are there breadcrumbs, et cetera? And returning back to our three-pronged approach, uh, we were able to take the findings and examples from each of these sections to help inform uh, our accessibility training for the client. So for example, the accessibility audit provided a baseline uh, for the low hanging fruit or you know, any of the issues that were present in the code. The manual review or catching things that were uh, no, sorry, that are not evident within a automated scan. So testing your site for keyboard navigation uh, and then actually testing the, uh, or checking the quality of your alt text. And the usability studies demonstrated usability issues on their site and helped identify those common user frustration and their needs, uh, which also, as we were just talking about, validated some of the known accessibility concerns that were found in the audit. Okay, so while setting up the training, uh, returning to some of the challenges that we listed earlier on in the presentation, we had some obstacles that we had to work around. So to summarize, first, it was really hard to know how to customize their needs uh, since they had 
since we had limited access to their back end, which is something we normally do for other clients. And with different teams joining the workshop, we really wanted to make sure that all of the information was useful to everyone, uh, that it wasn't too surface level, but however, not too complex for those hearing this, for those hearing this information for the first time, striving for that teaching tone rather than a preaching tone. And we also wanted to create something that was empowering and informative uh, because we recognize that there are varying levels of responsibility uh, for those that with this client uh, and also the varying levels of administrative power across the site um, of those who would be attending our training. So we wanted to make sure that they had the tools and information needed to implement those fixes uh, on their end. And I'm gonna hand it back to Rachel, who's gonna take us through to the end. Awesome, thanks, Devin. So as we were setting up the trainings for the client, luckily we were able to start with something tried and true. Uh, at Sandstorm, Devin and I run uh, training sessions called Access Hours, where we break down WCAG and best practices into different chunks for our internal teams with lots and lots of examples. Uh, and you can see uh, an example of that on the right hand side of your screen, some of the information that we provide to our internal team. And we've also done this with lots of clients before. So we've had some time to test what works and what doesn't and take that information forward. So overall, we have a we like to set the stage for an accessible and a successful session for all of our trainings. We first start by establishing that this is a place to learn and to ask questions. There's no question too small. We also provide a lot of definitions, uh, best practices from the disability community, a high level overview of WCAG, those web content accessibility guidelines, uh, different types of disabilities and how people with those disabilities might interact with web content. And depending on the client, we also provide a high level overview of the business case for accessibility. Uh, as Devin mentioned, we also strive for a teaching tone rather than a preaching tone because for a lot of our clients, this is the very first time they've ever even heard of accessibility and we want to empower them. We don't want to make them feel shame that they didn't know what they didn't know. We also want to give our clients digestible content with lots of added resources if they want to dive deeper. So we provide lots and lots and lots of examples that we pull directly from their site that are usually found in the audit itself, sometimes in usability tests. Uh, and we also like to add in experiences of users with disabilities firsthand whenever we possibly can. We point out those easy fixes. And like I mentioned, we always provide further reading and resources at the end of the deck in case someone wants to read more about a particular topic, more in depth than we can provide in a training. We also make sure that they are 60 minute workshops and that they're not lectures. So of course, as we all know, Zoom fatigue is a very real thing. Uh, and we want to follow accessibility best practices ourselves. So we provide plenty of pauses for questions and general breaks. And we also work through some examples and questions live with the client. So we provide those examples to teach and then we work through some more difficult ones on the site with them as well. And what we found throughout these uh, throughout these trainings is that providing human experiences really helps information stick. So we do our best to add perspectives from people with disabilities to help make things less abstract for clients, because showing them that it affects real life people who come to their site every day encourages them to go beyond compliance and create a more delightful user experience for everyone. So now we just kind of like to tie in a nice little bow on this and provide you with some key learnings throughout working with this client. So first, our three-pronged approach, combining that automated audit, uh, manual review, and UX testing ended up being really successful. We also found that it's easier than you think to include people with disabilities in your research. Uh, some clients think that you need to specifically earmark resources for that, but that's not necessarily true as long as you're really thoughtful with your participant survey. We also found that explaining why is just as important as explaining what. So, uh, for example, explaining accessibility changes that needed to be made just on their own was too abstract and it felt like a checklist to clients. But if you connect those changes to tangible, real differences that it can make for users with disabilities in their everyday lives, clients feel much more empowered and motivated to enact those changes. 
We also want to emphasize that even a small shift left is still a shift left. Uh, we talk a lot about creating user experiences with people with disabilities in mind from day one, but without a mature accessibility program, it can often get pushed up to development where it's more expensive and much slower to implement. So of course we talk about shift left in the accessibility process to design or even into the research phase when it's possible, but some clients aren't quite there yet. So it's important to remember that disability awareness is still a win in and of itself. And hopefully those learnings will carry forward and stick into clients' brains when they're designing future experiences. So overall, Good UX is accessible. Accessible UX is good. Uh, accessibility and UX aren't and shouldn't be separate. Uh, you can't say you have a good user experience if about 26% of the US population can't enjoy it, right? So include people with disabilities in your UX research and in your designs, and you're going to end up creating a more delightful and overall better UX experience, UX experience for all. And that takes us home. All right, awesome. Well, thank you, Devin and Rachel, for a great presentation. Uh, and thanks for sharing the tips and recommendations for accessibility training that folks can apply and take back to their uh, teams. So appreciate that. All right, so we got uh, a little bit over seven minutes left for Q&A. Uh, so let's dive right into the questions. And for folks, uh, if you have questions, please continue to submit them in the Q&A session in the Q&A section of the chat. So, uh, all right, so first question I have here is, how did you recruit your testers for usability testing? Do you mind if I take this one, Devin? Go for it. Awesome. So the way that we end up recruiting uh, for usability testing really changes based on the client and their needs. Um, so for this particular client, uh, we did social media pushes. So I believe we were did one on Twitter and on LinkedIn in kind of professional groups of folks who might want to pursue certifications in cloud training. Uh, and we can also, sometimes if we're lucky, we can tap into our own networks. For example, because we're at an agency, some of our developers may know some people who are interested in these trainings as well. Um, we've had So we've had successful social media pushes. Um, we've also had clients reach out to their own listservs. There's a lot of different ways that you can do it. Awesome. Thank you for sharing those tips. Uh, all right, so I have a couple of questions here. They're both related to the uh, accessibility training. Uh, so one question here is, you know, they want to know more about the accessibility training and specifically what are some of the activities that are included in the workshops? I think I can take that one. Uh, so basically, when we're setting up uh, the training itself, we try to, you know, veer away from like a lecture style of presenting this material to folks because we want this to be a more inviting and empowering experience. So uh, when we do set up our training, again, like Rachel said, uh, in the presentation, we're really setting the stage for making sure that we're all on the same page with understanding the language. So we provide definition. Uh, we set the stage that this is a learning environment and that we're all learning uh, together. Uh, and then we always set up uh, lots of, uh, sorry, pause moments for questions uh, so that we're taking the time to, uh, you know, answer immediate questions and, you know, workshop specific examples if they come prepared with questions uh, already set up. So it is more of a uh, workshop. If we were all in person, I would say it was more of a round circle. Um, if we could all, you know, imagine that this in this year in the pandemic. <laughs> uh, so we do aim to kind of, a, you know, uh, we're aiming style of presentation rather than uh, just telling people like you need to meet these things because it's important because of this reason when it's more of an experience, uh, you know, that we all bring value to the workshop and that we all, you know, can learn together. So I hope I answered your question. Yeah. And, yeah. And to add to that, what we'll often do, for example, if it's training someone on how to write good alt text is we'll have some examples that are totally disconnected from their site so we can just provide a good baseline. Then we'll take an example or two from their site where they could use improved alt text and show them what we would write. And then we'll add some links and say, okay, what would you write here? And we'll walk through it together. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, having examples uh, is definitely a good way to uh, 
uh, help folks understand and, and, and deliver the, uh, the message. Uh, all right, so another question is here is about the UX report. So you mentioned that uh, part of the deliverable is an actionable, actionable US, UX report. So they were just curious on what's included in that report. I can take this one. Um, so <laughs> uh, that report and I became best friends. So uh, what we can, what we usually provide is first we'll provide a high level executive summary. So like one or two pages that if you only read this, here are the most important things that you need to know when we tested this site with your users. Uh, we then provide high level findings that are commonalities across tasks. So for example, if the navigation isn't working the way it is, that's something that we'll include as a high level key finding. We then break it down uh, based task by task, every single thing that we found. So task one, for example, was find a certification that meets your needs. What, who passed, uh, who passed with difficulty and who failed? And why did they fail? What wasn't working? So for example, they might say, I don't know how much pre prerequisite knowledge I have to say to have to complete this certification. That might be an insight we include. Or people might say, I couldn't find a button that makes sense to me. That might be an insight that we include. And then we think about, okay, if we were able to redesign this experience, how would we make it so that the users did not encounter those frustrations? So maybe it's something as simple as changing the text label on a button. Maybe it's something as complex as completely redoing the information architecture on the site, but we never just want to hand over a report that just says, problem, 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 problem. We also want to provide solutions on how we could improve the experience. Excellent. Thank you, both Devin and Rachel. Uh, all right, so I think we have time maybe for one more question. Uh, question is, do you often find more clients reaching out to become more access accessible or, you, or, or have, have you had success in offering it cold? So, I mean, being a customer being proactive and coming to you versus, you know, you having to reach out to customers. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Devin, you want to take that one? Yeah, I was just trying to think about how to answer that question. So, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, as an agency, we it is one of the points that we are trying to reach out to folks and let them know, like, hey, we do offer this uh, way to support you and your website. However, uh, it does come up more in a conversation uh, setting. So people, like in this instance, you know, they did come to us with, uh, you know, initially wanting to improve their overall usability, uh, but then later on in the conversation, they're like, oh, hey, ooh, accessibility needs to be worked on as well. Do you do that? And we did. So it's, it's more conversational, I guess, uh, and more folks coming to us and asking us in, in those initial conversations as well. Uh, Rachel, I don't know if you have any other insights and other conversations. Yeah. I know you've been on a few more calls than I have. <laughs> yeah. We also, so. Yeah, we also have who have been working with us for five, 10 years coming and saying, oh, we heard about this thing that we are supposed to be doing. It's called accessibility. Have you heard of it? Uh, and, and we're like, yes, we have heard of it. Actually, we offered trainings for that. Um, and we can piggyback on, on that opportunity as well. So it really has run the gamut. Um, over, I would say even the last six months, we've had some people approaching us cold, asking if, if it's something that we do, um, but we're also tapping into it to folks who have approached us for other UX and have anything to do with accessibility. But as I mentioned, good use at UX is accessible. So usually it's, um, we, it's a nice marriage there. Uh, and we also have current clients come to us uh, asking for those services as well. Excellent, awesome. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, so I want to thank both Devin and Rachel for a great session. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And just a reminder, you can always come back to the same session page and watch the recording at any time. Uh, so thank you again for attending. Have a great day, evening, and uh, enjoy the rest of XCon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Everyone. Bye. Thank you.